Welcome to the World Builders Anvil, episode 123. Today's topic, how to turn your geek into business. Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place that will help prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builders Anvil. I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram. Let's sup from the mug of Java and build. Welcome back. As always, I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram. And I am your substitute co-host, <laughs> Kristen Ingram. Yeah. Uh, so today I'm having my wife on for a very special reason. One, she knows what she's talking about. Um, uh, it's mainly the one. And uh, <laughs> That's it. <laughs> she knows what she's doing. She knows what she's doing. But um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was how to turn your sort of geek fandom into a business. And one of the important reasons why I really want to talk about this is so many people I know, whether they're game masters or they're authors or artists, um, cosplayers, pour a lot of money and effort into what they do, countless hours, because they just love doing it. I think with a little bit of restructuring, you could very easily have a business set up. And even if you don't want to do it full time, you can help get an idea of how much it's costing you and actually take some advantages of that, you know, so maybe you pay a little bit less in taxes because of it. Well, and the thing is, too, is that, you know, if this is something that you're super passionate about, mm -hmm. there are probably other people that are super passionate about it as well. Mm -hmm. And there are ways that you can generate revenue. Yeah. And have some money come in from this thing that you're that you absolutely love to do. Mm -hmm. I, I know there are more and more sites now, if you're a game master, where you can actually build modules or content for uh, D20 and put it up there. But then no one ever finds it or buys it because they don't know it's there. Right. So I think part of what we're going to talk about today is not only getting you set up as a business, but also getting you on that path to promoting it correctly yeah. and building an audience for it. Sort of what's the minimum that you need to really have a business goal. Exactly. So the first thing that you need to focus on is you need to focus on your brand. Mm. What is your brand? What potential products or services do you want to offer? And what are you going to call it? Yeah. And there's two types of brands to think about in this. The first brand is yourself. You are always your ultimate brand, especially when you're talking about fictional output, you know, whether it be writing or being an artist, because someone might really like one of the books you've written, but might not think about buying a little bit different series of a book that you write because they know the books, they don't know you. But if they become your stark raving fan, the big thing you're going to find out is you could do anything. If they're your fan, they're going to want to buy it. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, when you're thinking about branding, you kind of have to think about this twofold because you want to be part of your brand. Mm. So that way, as different products roll out, you're still at the core of that. Yeah. Yeah, and then once you start looking at your products, you say, okay, let, let me create a new product, which is, let's say I want to create a game, you know, like a board game or a role-playing game uh, around something of mine. You know, what are three things I can spin off of from that to get people essentially a free taste and then buy in a little bit and then buy in a lot? Well, and that's the thing. So if you think about what we do, Right. Cause Jeff and I are married and we've got a number of brands. And I would imagine that the people that listen to this show aren't even aware of all the brands mm -hmm. that we have. So we have an umbrella brand, which is called Ingram Digital Media, which is kind of the, the holding company for all of our other brands. Because yeah. in addition to World Builders Anvil, we also have Garduel, which mm -hmm. is your world. We've got a podcast that we do together called Small Biz Life. Yep. I have a brand called Accounting and Focus. And so 
rather than setting up like 20 different companies, yeah. we said, okay, what is something that could cover all of the paths that we're taking? Mm-hmm. And let's get that. Yeah. And then have the brands underneath it. So if you're thinking about a particular product or service now, that may not be your brand. Yes. That is a product that you have. Mm-hmm. And so if you're thinking about delivering lots of different content or maybe you're going to split things off, don't pigeonhole yourself into one thing. Yeah. So kind of, you know, you need to be kind of forward thinking when you're thinking about the overall brand. Mm-hmm. You know, and if something that you sell is small, think about what you could do to add more uh, fun more content to that product because that's maybe the next level product for that, you know, because ultimately what you can do is, and we'll get more into this later in the episode, but as you're building out a a sales funnel to get people to buy your product, once they've bought that product, you know, and you've spent time building up and automating the way the, the marketing is done for it, then you want to start selling them to the next level product. And you can maybe have two or three products uh, along a certain path, and then you can start something new and start creating products over there as well, too. Yeah, exactly. So n- now that you've learned a little bit about brands, l- let's move on to a business license. That sounds very, very complicated. It's really not. Depending on where you live, it's either called a business license or it's a trade name certificate. And essentially what you're doing is you're taking that brand that you have developed and you're reserving the name for it. So typically to get a business license, you would either go to your town or your county. And this is if you're setting up a DBA. This is doing business as. In a lot of states, you don't need to do this if you incorporate. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to figure out what the rules are in your area. But typically a business license is just going down to your town hall or going down to your county hall and saying, you know, I want to reserve this name so that nobody else can use it. And usually it'll cost you anywhere between $5 to $20. Okay. It's not super expensive. And there's not like a lot. You don't have to come up with rules of partnerships or corporate uh, bylaws to do that. No, that's why, you know, I recommend just starting out as a sole proprietorship. Mm. It's really inexpensive. You're not subject to a lot of the business taxes. Some states, if you're an LLC or you're a corporation, there's like an entity tax or there's a minimum business tax. Most of the time, if you just set up as a sole proprietorship, you don't have to deal with any of that. Okay. Cool. Makes things simple. Well, that's how we like it here in the World Builders Amble. We want to be making things we don't want to be filling out business forms. Right, yeah. right. And that's kind of why we're going over this is that if you follow these steps, at least, especially like the the next couple that we talk about, mm-hmm. it's going to make the business side much easier. Yeah. All right. Now, the next one we want to talk about is uh, what I call the fine, but I believe that's a, a bit of an outdated name at this point, the EIN. Right. So once you have your business name reserved, then you want to go to the IRS website and you want to apply for a, it's called a federal employer identification number, a federal EIN. I, I do not want employees. Okay. So this isn't so much, you have to have one of these if you have employees, but I recommend that all businesses have them because essentially what this does is it sets up an ID number for your business. Most of you are probably going to engage in business that's either online or that you're going to be accepting credit cards. Mm -hmm. The the EIN acts like a social security number for your business. I do not like giving out my social security number. Yeah. Okay. Because there's so much identity theft out there. What this will allow you to do is this will allow you to give them this number instead of your social security number. So it helps kind of protect your social security number because everywhere you go, you're going to be giving out this number. Mm. So if you sign up for a PayPal account, you're going to use this number. If you sign up for, you know, a Stripe account, you're going to give them this number. 
Um, when you set up banking relationships, you're going to give them this number. If you're doing any sort, like say you, say you go to a convention and the convention pays you, mm-hmm. you're going to give them this number okay. so that you don't have to give out your social security number. Any, anywhere that you might get paid. Correct. Anywhere you might get paid, you're going to use this number instead. So it just, it protects your social security number because you never know once you give your social security number out, you don't know how good the person paying you or the entity paying you is going to be at protecting that information. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think about this too. I mean, the IRS got hacked itself. So the likelihood that uh, an online service you're using could be hacked is pretty great at this point. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and once you get that, you also, you have to check to see if you need to get a state ID number. This is especially important if whatever you're going to do is subject to sales tax. So you want to make sure that once you get your federal ID, go and see if you need a state one also. And now, correct me if I'm wrong, but just because you said the business is not what determines whether or not you pay sales tax. It's the fact that you sell stuff and what you're selling, correct? Right. It's based on what you're selling. So sales tax is typically only charged in the state that your business is in. So for us, if we're in Connecticut, if we send products or we do services in Connecticut, it may be subject to sales tax. Mm -hmm. Sales tax is one of those things that is so overly complicated. Um, And that's the one thing that kind of really gets people when they're starting their businesses. So if you're not sure, you know, talk to somebody who knows about sales tax. Because I'd imagine for most people, if Amazon is the platform you're selling from, that's not a concern you have to have. Right. Amazon handles the sales tax for you. But like if you're going to conventions and selling stuff, Mm -hmm. uh, Whatever state you're in, you're probably subject to their sales tax rules, correct? Correct. And I know I was doing research for a friend of mine who wanted to sell at the St. Louis Convention Center. Mm-hmm. Um, and they like in in Missouri, they have different sales tax rates in every town. Mm. And then even like the convention center has its own rate yeah. that's different than if you sold something outside on the sidewalk. <laughs> so you know, if this is something that you want to do, I would highly recommend that you get in touch with a tax person who really knows what they're talking about and someone who understands your type of business. Yeah. Because there are a lot of tax people out there that understand like brick and mortar businesses, mm-hmm. you know, like a a small storefront. Once you start getting into the world of either online business or, you know, people who travel around, like if you're going to different conventions and selling stuff. A lot of accountants like don't understand that world yeah. at all. This is one of the reasons why my wife is on the show is as a CPA who likes this kind of stuff. She's actually very knowledgeable in it. And so that's one of the reasons why I really wanted her. Michael is a great guy, but does not really seem to have his sales tax information down. I was very disappointed. <laughs> I, I'm sure he could make something up. <laughs> well, but that probably wouldn't be good. We do lie. And this is one, one of the, Few times I don't find it appropriate, which yeah. is strange. Um, that I have that line I mean. Okay. Um, and now we, we have this, this entity, uh, m- name. Uh, we have a license for the entity. We, ha- we've gone to the IRS. We have the number, which so far we've spent maybe a half a day's worth of work. Yeah. I mean, you could probably. Including number four, this is probably half a day. Okay, including number four. Mm-hmm. So what is number four? What is the fourth? And th- this is probably the most important thing, I think. Yeah, so I don't know four is to have a separate bank account. There's a couple reasons why you want to do this. First, it makes it much easier to keep your business stuff separate from your personal it allows you to see how much do I have to feed this business, Mm -hmm. right? How much money do I have to put into it? Because I think a lot of people, when they start out a business and they're running it through their personal account, they don't realize how much money they're spending. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a separate account and you put some money into it, and remember you're using your, your federal EIN in order to set this up, but you put some money in the account and then 
whenever you have a business cost, a business expense, you pay it out of that account. And this lets you see like, hey, if you run out of money, oh, I got to put more money into that account. Mm -hmm. And you kind of become a little bit more cautious about how you're spending money because there's so many like, you know, there's so many glitzy things. There's yeah. so many really cool tools and you're like, oh my God, I need to have them all. Mm -hmm. And you don't really need to have them all, yeah. especially when you're first getting started. No. I, I mean, most stuff we'll talk about is low or no cost up front. And so another reason that you want to have the separate bank account is it's going to make tax time a lot easier mm -hmm. because when you go to see your tax preparer, you can summarize what's in the bank statements and you know that everything that's in there is business related. Mm -hmm. One more reason we were talking about identity theft. If you have a separate bank account for your business and that bank account is compromised, it's not your personal funds. Mm. And so a lot of times when we're first starting up, we're, we don't have a lot of money in our business bank accounts. I know for me, when when the business bank accounts get to a certain level, I transfer the money into savings yeah. or I transfer them into our personal account. So there's never a tremendous amount of money in there. Or then they flow into my author account. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that way, so if, if there's a breach, if something happens, you're limiting your exposure. Mm. You know, so like your rent money isn't in that account. Yeah. Or your mortgage payment isn't in that account. And so it just helps protect you in case, you know, there is a breach. And one of the things I like about it too is you can actually see revenue coming in. So it, let's say you have a few products out there. Maybe you're selling a couple of books on Amazon or you're selling a module on the D20 site. Um, those are wonderful. Uh, and you, you probably even know that you're not making money uh, early on. You, you're probably not even expecting to make money. But the thing is, you can see what money is coming back into that account to see really, you know, maybe I have, you know, my book up in three different places. What place do I make the most money from? It helps you understand where your money is coming from at what source. And then the beautiful thing is uh, certain types of activities, if they're business related, you can then deduct in your taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, cons. If you, if you're going to cons and, and you're going to network and meet people, you know, if you have a business function there, that now I can write off against my money, against the money I make. Right, exactly. So when you set up this bank account, you want to make sure that all of your payments flow into that account. So, you know, just thinking about some of the businesses we have, we have an AdSense account mm -hmm. because one of our businesses has ads on the website and there are also YouTube videos that have ads. So that's one revenue stream. Our credit card processing goes into that account. So if you got a Stripe account or a PayPal account, that money would go into that. Any direct payments that you receive, whether you're doing consulting work, whether you know, you're selling a product or service, you want all of those revenue streams to be linked up to that business bank account. Mm. So that is sort of the core fundamental of things that you really need on the business side to get started, essentially the behind the scenes stuff that you really need to get going. And now it's going to get much more fun. Yes. Uh, now, and a lot of you have some of these things already. Uh, they might not be structured to flow out of the account. Just, you know, when you get your bank account set up, the first thing you want to do is the domain you have or that you're planning to buy, have those domains get paid from your business account. And um, a domain is very important. Uh, it gives you an online place. And you want at least one that is sort of a centerpiece for the stuff that you're doing with that. And then you might have other ones as well, too. But we're not too concerned about those right now. But you want to have at least one where people can get to. They get the content that you're creating, the free stuff, or access to be able to get to where they can pay for the stuff as well, too. Right. And domains are really inexpensive. They're about $10 a year. Mm -hmm. Um, we use Namecheap. Yeah. And if you go to the show notes for this episode, we'll actually have a discount code for Namecheap. I would recommend that you also see if you can buy your name. Yeah. Because we had talked about, you know, you're, you are always an integral part of your brand. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get your name.com, your name.me, go do that. Yeah. Because you don't want somebody else buying that later. Mm-hmm. Exactly, especially if you become famous and then 
they essentially hold it for ransom. It's like I bought Jeffrey W. Ingram.com, and really all it does is it forwards to my bio page on Guard Duel. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, for the $10 a year, you know, I think so far we've probably spent less than 20 bucks, probably. Mm-hmm. Depending on where you live. Depending on where you live. So, you know, really spend the extra 10 bucks and buy your name as well. Mm-hmm. The other important reason to have a domain is websites are more important than social media as an overall strategy to keep and retain business. And the problem with social media is the rules change all the time on where and how people will see your information. If I go and post on my Facebook page right now, maybe on a good day, 6% of my fans will actually see that post. That's a good day. Um, not a great day, but a good day. Um, and that will change probably a little bit again next year. And all of these sites are kind of like that. Or the opposite is Twitter, where sure, everything gets shown to the people who follow me. And they have about 30 seconds. If they happen to be on Twitter at that point, looking at their feed at that point, they might see my update with my new episode. Right. And the thing is, too, is that social media is always changing. So... You know, if you've been involved with social media for a long time, you know, you remember MySpace and everyone's like, oh, MySpace is the greatest thing Mm -hmm. ever. And MySpace is dead now. Mm -hmm. You know, so just because Facebook is the hot thing right now doesn't mean that it will continue to be. Mm -hmm. You know, just because a lot of people are into Periscope right now doesn't mean that Periscope is going to survive. You have to have that home base that you own Mm -hmm. that will always be yours no matter what. And it doesn't matter how social media changes. Because ultimately, you're using that to do two things. One, to sell your product. And two, and probably more importantly early on, goes right into our next point, which is email list. The best way you can communicate with people is via email if they give you permission to. Right. Absolutely. Because you know that it's going to land in their email box. Mm -hmm. And they've said they want it to land in their email box. And so you can build a relationship with people in the email box. And I personally put in all my emails, please respond and ask if you have any questions or comments on this email. And it's funny because I recently got an email from someone who listens to the show who actually said they hope that I would respond Because a lot of people will say that and they don't. Now, I don't always give great responses because of time pressures, but I always try and respond to every email. Right. And I think that's, this is where I've seen a lot of businesses falter, is that they are on social media, they have a product go viral, and then they never build an email list. Yeah. So now when that next product comes out and they want to be able to tell people about it, they can't. Yeah, w- w- which is amazing. Um, you know, and, and we've met people who have actually had their shot and been noticed. And then because they don't have the way to communicate with their fans, you know, outside of social media, when the fans stop paying as much attention to them as they were, their sales suffer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you've got to make sure, you know, that email list is going to give you the opportunity that when you've got something to say, You can say it. And no matter how big you get, the thing you have to remember is there is so much noise going on out there now. You need a leg up to talk to them. Um, Just because you're hot and your social media gets covered a lot now, when it starts to fade, it might not even be their will. It's just they don't happen to see it. And you can't be so arrogant to think that you're going to dominate people's news feeds all the time. Right. So there's... You know, so you want to set up your email list. If you're going low cost, you can start with something like MailChimp. Mm -hmm. MailChimp is free for the first 2,000 subscribers. The only limitation with the free account is that you can't have, you can't have it automatically send out messages for you. Yeah. So that's one limitation. We'll kind of talk about that in the next item. But, and we've evolved. So like we first started with MailChimp. Mm Mm-hmm. And then we went to AWeber, right? Because we needed something that was a little bit more powerful. You know, an AWeber costs us about $16 a month. Mm -hmm. And then 
Now we're at the stage where we need something even more powerful. So we're going to convert kit, mm-hmm. which is about $50 a month. Yeah. So the nice thing is that there are options at all price points, including free. Yes. You know, which is nice. But then, you know, you've got other options that will give you more power, more options, mm-hmm. more flexibility as you start making some money. Now, you might have an excuse of, well, I'm not ready to release my first book yet or my first product, my game isn't ready, or whatever I'm doing might not be ready at this point. Who cares? One, you can set up a website for a very low cost as well, too. There might, I'm not sure on free hosting outside of like WordPress.com, which is somewhat limited, but you might be able to do it there. Um, or for a low cost of, you know, probably usually starting around $4 a month or where we go, I think it's about $10 a month, which is probably more honest of what it will cost you over time. And the thing is, you can set up a WordPress site for free. There are free themes out there, and there are free plugins to let you build almost any site you want for 10 bucks a month. And you might need help, but you have friends. You're in the geek community. We love helping each other. We love to talk, to just interact at that level, to have relationships with people. That's a beautiful thing in this scenario, because if you get stuck on how to do something, you can ask. You know, and the great thing is with a newsletter, you know, you can start building up momentum to sell a product. And that is the key is, and maybe you end up with 10, 20, 30 people. Those are 10, 20, or 30 more people you have that are at least somewhat interested in buying your product than the zero you'll start off with if you wait till you have the product. Right. And so there's, you know... You have to have some reason why people should sign up for your list. Mm -hmm. And typically it's not, hey, I have a list, sign up. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's typically not enough. So if you're selling a product, you know, you might want to offer somebody like a coupon code Mm -hmm. that, hey, if you sign up for my list, I'll send you a coupon. Um, I had, it was funny because when we had the idea for Small Biz Life, which is our other show, Like, we didn't really know what we were going to do with it yet. We didn't know how we were going to start. So we put up, we put up a page, um, using a service called Thrive Themes, Mm -hmm. which is a wonderful, which is a wonderful service. They've got great templates. We just put something up that said, hi, I'm going to send you business tips. Mm -hmm. Sign up for my list. And I got over a hundred people to sign up just with that. Yep. That I'm going to send you business tips. You know, if you're an author, it's simple. Write a short story. You know, get a couple people to edit it for you for free. You know, send it out in a PDF form to people who sign up. Yours is a mind map, right? Mine's a mind map for the framework that I use to build worlds. And so that's the thing. So when somebody signs up for your list, they get that. Yeah, and I I actually have a bunch of like small things that I find cool that I just kind of give away for free too. And those are fine too, but you got to sort of have one that you're pushing. Right. So that's the thing. It's it's literally as simple as, you know, setting up a blank web page that says, this is what I'm going to give you for free if you sign up, enter your email address. Mm. And then that will work with your email list and allow you to send stuff out. Yeah. And just one, you know, one quick tip with the email list, provide valuable content. Mm. Don't just constantly email them about new products you have and new things you're selling. Yeah. You know, so depending on what you do, it might be, you know, if you're an author, you know, you can talk to people about your characters and how you develop them. If you're a gamer, you can send out tips on how to create better characters, how to describe locations better. Mm -hmm. You know, there's lots of free things that you can send out to people so that you're not always selling, selling, selling. Yeah. And a really good book for that, Gary Vanderchuk has a book called Jab, 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 Right Hook. Ouch. And it's about social media, but it also applies to email, that you've got to kind of interact with your list. You've got to kind of prime them up. you got to get them excited. you got to give them some free content and then right hook for the same. Mm-hmm. The thing is, you know, what I try and do in my newsletters, I try and have one thing I get them to do every week, which is usually innocuous. You know, hey, click on this to download, respond, send me an email, just simple stuff 
to get them in the practice of interacting with me. That's all I, that's all I really want. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it really just helps charge me and keep me going. But it also gets them used to interacting with me through the email. You know, if I'm stuck on, uh, you know, do I want version A or version B? I can ask my list and I'll get feedback and hopefully one of the two will be positive. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right. And so the last thing that we need to do is talk about automating a marketing plan. And essentially, and the idea, I got this is from Brendan Bouchard. And the idea is you take the first year when you launch a product to come up with ways to sell it to people. And you're, you're sort of playing around with it. You're offering them different ways through email to get them to sign up. And obviously part of it is you want a big launch when you're selling stuff, especially on a site like Amazon. It helps you if you get a lot of sales up front, a lot of reviews. So a lot of it is trying to get that kind of stuff to happen. But the thing is you look at what, how successful or unsuccessful it is. You tweak it around a little bit. And then after pushing that one product for a year, whether it be your book or your game or your YouTube channel, whatever it is, you sort of take that, you automate it through your email service provider. That way, uh, the emails are all automatic and they all will pop up once in a while and try and help pull people from this person who interacts with you on a free level to a person who interacts with you on a free level and buys your products or services. Yeah. And I think you make a really good point because so many times I think we develop a product and then we launch that product and then we start developing the next product yeah. and we don't spend any time actually trying to sell the product that we just like slaved yeah. over. And that's not saying you don't, I'm not saying don't stop writing your next novel because you're working to sell this, but you have to have a certain amount of time to try and build up the sales of that because having more sales there will also help you gain more sales for your next novel. And the thing is most books, and this is from Tim Graw, spike up and sell most of their numbers within the first month. You know, and we're, it's good to have a spike when you first start. What you really want is reoccurring revenue from your books. So there needs to be a plan going forward of how to sell that book to people who've not yet bought it. Right. Exactly. So when we talk about an automated marketing plan, we're, we're going back to the, the email list and we're saying, okay, what offer, what opt-in can I give to somebody so that they will get on my list? Mm -hmm. Then I need to provide them with value, you know, so they think that, hey, this is really good content. Hey, this is helping me out. And then you make the offer like, hey, this is the thing that I have to sell. Mm -hmm. And so when Jeff talks about automating that process, He's talking about, you know, the the emails going out after somebody signs up. Hey, here's the free thing you signed up mm -hmm. for. Here are some other tips. And then here's mm -hmm. my course, my book, my coaching, my, my, what, game. my game, whatever it is that you're selling. Then, you know, you deliver that after like, wow, this is really good information. So let's say that you're into cosplay. And you want to, you're going to sell people a course on how to make better low cost costumes. Mm -hmm. You would want to provide some, you know, you want to have something, a PDF, a video, something they get for signing up. Then you want to have, you know, some more value. So maybe it's a couple more videos. Maybe it's, you know, tips on where to get inexpensive materials. And then you go for, you know, hey, if you like this, you know, here's the course I'm selling. Mm -hmm. Here's the book I'm selling. Or or maybe your, your bent would be you want to make it for other people. So maybe, you know, it's like, hey, maybe you really like the idea of this, but you, you're just not into making it. So why don't you come here and we'll set up some time to help create some great uh, gear for you, you know. And there's a lot of crossover with like cosplay and live action role players. So you got to think a little bit bigger than the audience that you might be in because some people who don't consider themselves cosplayers have costumes. <laughs> so uh, they could potentially be your audience as well, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could be, you know, people who go to Ren Fairs, people who go to reenactments. There's a lot of crossover between those groups. Mm -hmm. 
And the thing is, when you do it well, you will find an audience for yourself out there. You know, the idea is to know who your audience is to deliver content they will find valuable. Right. So I'm hoping we actually inspired you a little bit today to take your hobby and do something more with it. Maybe in your mind you've always wanted to. Maybe you want to get away from your job and you want to do it full time. Or maybe you love your job and you just want to do it part time, but you wish it didn't cost you so much. Well, take a few minutes, go through these seven items we gave you. And if you sign up for my email newsletter, I will actually give out a free PDF going over these uh, topics as well. Just a reminder, a quick checklist of, do I have this? Do I have that? What are they? Then you have one spot you can keep track of all of that in and use that as a foundation to start trying to grow your business. And it'll also give you some tips too outside of what we talked about today. So like, how do you pick the bank that you're going to use? Yeah. You know, what, sh- what questions should you be asking? Where can you get your domain? What are some options for the email list? What should you be looking for when you select an email provider? Get out there, start growing it, and treat it like a business even though you are an artist, and I get that. But the thing is, the more people you can get to buy your art, the thing that you do that you love, the more time you can spend creating stuff for people to buy, to do, or sometimes you can give it away, whatever you want to do. When you start making money from it, it gives you the flexibility to spend more time doing live action role playing, spend more time at conventions doing cosplay, or more time writing and selling books. You know, so the thing is, you're helping yourself to help your audience. Help your audience buy your product. And so for that, we're going to go right into the world builder's task of the day. The task of the day is to either pick, you know, one story or game you've made in the past and put together a plan to start marketing it. And for the real world task of the day, get 10 people who you know are interested in your subject. And if you're like me, you know 10 people who are interested in the kind of geekery that you present. Approach them in email or give them a phone call. These are people you know, but you know who want it. Ask them if they're interested to join your email list. Ask them individually. This isn't a blast email out to everyone you know. This is an individualized email to people you know. Target 10 people at first. And you're going to say, but aren't I going to need a bigger list than that? Yes, but the thing is, if you can get 10 people, you don't have to think about the size of your list so much. You can think about, I'm giving a seminar this week to 10 people, so I have to get it done. Yeah, it really helps when there are people on your list to get you to send out stuff to it. (laughs) And I think 10 people is a good number to start with. Mm -hmm. You know, and even too, like after you, you know, when you put your list together and you've got your, you know, your splash page, your page, you know, that we said to get people to sign up for your list, you know, call those 10 people and then like share it across your social media, Mm -hmm. you know, so put it up on your Facebook, put it up on Twitter, whatever social media you use. And you're going to see, you'll get some more people to Mm -hmm. sign up, you know, but you've got to start somewhere. And once you know that you've got 10 people on your list, it's so much easier to send out that mail. Yeah. And, and you might think what you're doing is very niche and a lot of people won't like it. One of the things to keep in mind is I've had over 30,000 downloads and I'm well on my way to 40,000 downloads for a show where I talk about fantasy world building. And that's it. And that's a niche of the niche of the niche. So don't, don't think about there aren't a lot of people. You're going to find out there's a lot more than you expect when you start. The only thing is you have to start. And now the tease for the next episode is. The pregame show. And as always, make sure to go to garduel.com. That's G A R D U L.com for the show notes. It'll be under podcasting, world builders, and that's a great place to get all of the information from the episode that you just listened to and to see all the resources that we've talked about in this episode. Thanks for joining us this episode of the World Builders and Please be sure to rate and review us in iTunes. And please help get the word out to your friends about our show. And join me, Jeffrey W. Ingram at Garduel.com to see the progress of my world and learn why I made the choices I did. And please contact me and let me know the topics you would love to hear in the future. Now strike while the myth rolls high.